Hello. So um, we wanted to welcome Dr. Deborah Dean to our um, writer interview series for the Writers Who Care blog. So glad you could be Thank here. you. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. I have the fortune of um, interviewing her in person because we work together at Brigham Young University. Um, so while some of the other interviews that you'll see in this series are familiar Zoom phone calls, we are together in Debbie's office, which is really great. Um, so just as a little bit of background, I met Debbie when I was an undergraduate here at Brigham Young University and took a teaching writing class from her in, I think, 2005. Ooh. Um, she came to BYU uh, in 1999 and has been here ever since. Um, she, her research is in writing and grammar and pedagogy. Um, and she draws heavily on her 10 years of experience teaching junior high in Washington State before coming here to Utah. So we're here to talk about, Debbie has been busy. Um, not only has she written several books, but she's also rewritten several books. Um, and so today we're here to talk about her latest book that just came out from NCTE, um, What Works in Writing Instruction. So this is a the second edition of a yes. book that you've written yes. and here's the original that so you can this see. One. <laughs> um, this one's much skinnier. <laughs> the new one is skinnier. Yes. Okay, well, so tell us a little bit about the book. Okay, I will, I'll talk first about what I was thinking when I wrote this. So in 2007, um, Graham and Perrin published the What Works research. So since um, Hillux research in the 80s, it was the first meta-analysis of research in 25 years. What does research say works in the writing classroom? And they came up with 11 practices that, um, that research proves work in the classroom. And I was fascinated by what they found, excited about what they found. Um, you asked earlier about the connection to writing strategies. I had, I had learned as a teacher that my students didn't always transfer from one writing experience to the next. And so I kind of stumbled upon writing strategies as a way to approach teaching. And that was the first book I wrote. And when the Graham and Perrin report came out, writing strategies was in their 11 list, in their list of 11. So I was very happy to see that my work was validated by all this research. But, um, but what I thought was there was a lot of stuff in that 11 list that I had tried and it didn't always work as well as I thought. And one time I was um, presenting to a group of teachers and I asked, you know, it was when the report was new and I asked them, what, what would you expect to be on this list? And they said, they named some things and then I showed them the list and this one group just got up and started to walk out. And I was, I was like, what? And they said, well, we do all those things and it doesn't help our writers. So what does this research help me? And it made me think about it because I had, I kind of thought the same thing, writing process, what does that mean? And how does it help writers? Um, does it just stretch out things or does it do something more significant to them in their development as writers? And so part of what led to this book was that I wanted to dive in. I looked up all the research they had used. I looked up um, their studies. What were they looking at? And, and what I found was that with each one of the practices, there were some principles that had to be applied. And sometimes is a, I know from my own practice in the classroom that as a teacher, you don't always get to those principles. For instance, one of the principles was time. For a lot of the research practices, you need time. Well, what does a teacher not have? <laughs> time. time. And so our, our circumstances in the context of what we do sometimes work against implementing the yeah. good practices. Yeah. And so it was, I thought it was important for me to kind of dig down in and find out why those things worked and what were the what were the things that made them work? Why did, why did research say it worked when sometimes I couldn't make it work in my own classroom? So that's what the first book was about, those principles that kind of underscored those 11 practices in the research. So that's where the first one came from. Then what happened was NCT approached me and they said, okay, it's been 10 years since the original, actually over 10 years by the time they approached me, um, since that original What Works um, report. So what's changed? Let's see what's changed. And one of the interesting things that I found that made it, that makes this book almost a completely different book, uh, is that in the first report, they only looked at quantitative studies, only at certain kinds of, they had to fit within this very narrow range mm -hmm. of quantitative research. And 
even in that first report at the end of the um, writing next report, that what they said was that if they had a chance to look at other kinds of studies, they felt like they could flesh out more because they said we go into really effective teachers classrooms and there's a lot more going on there mm -hmm. than the research in those 11 elements could identify right and so between 2007 and 2018 or 19 when I was asked to write the second edition they had looked at all those other kinds so now we have we have um single case study reports we we have um uh, qualitative work we have all sorts of other kinds of studies that they have analyzed and then said, and here now are some other things that we know actually help students develop as writers in the classroom. So now it's not just those 11, but it's these other things that are found through other kinds of study. A lot of them are things that would be almost impossible to identify through quantitative yeah. work. Quantitative, along, yeah, yeah, quantitative. So, so anyway, so that's why the two books, and that's why this one is really not even at all the same. <laughs> this one. They're actually pretty much two separate books. So um, a friend of mine who's a teacher said, this one's more like, like researchy. This one's more like conversational and partly because the nature of the research changed so yeah. much. And so what I did was I took the old research and the new research and I put them next to each other. And I started trying to find ways that they blended and fit and how they reinforced each other. So instead of the 11 practices here, I have five chapters in this book that kind of look at more conceptually and then here are the here are the research principles that go underneath each one so so as a writer I think that revising is can be like really exciting but sometimes it also just feels so frustrating and a little overwhelming too so I love to see that this new book is shorter and it's like kind of surprising because you had more that more mm -hmm. to add more perspectives and like 10 or 11 years more of wisdom and knowledge that you've accumulated. So how, how did you approach the revision of such a monumental task? It wasn't just tweaking little paragraphs here and there. It was totally reconceptualizing the book. It was. And at first somebody said, I mean, the, the um, person I was working with in the editorial committee was like, no, just take the new stuff and add it on to each chapter. But when I looked at that, it, I tried and it, it didn't make sense, especially given the kind of more, um, Ah, I don't know, emotional nature of some of the new findings, like about the teacher's engagement and the, and the building community in the, in the classroom and, um, and things about how you collaborate. I mean, although collaboration is in this, there's more about collaboration as community building and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing in this. And so it didn't feel, this is, this is the first edition was pretty academic because yeah. it was really looking at quantitative research and what does it say and what are the principles. This one, because the research that kind of fed into that, although it built on this, really looked more at the kind of things you can't always touch or name. And so it really is more about who we are. And that was one of the things that I really, really liked about the new research is that they, they kept saying the teacher's the one that makes the difference. And they trusted... Really? And over and over again, they trusted in teachers' professional judgment in the classroom. So it's not this formula or that formula. It's like, here are some good tools. You find a way to mix those. What's well, like my cookies, you know? Um, so you find a way to mix those in a way that makes something that works in this situation, right. in your classroom with your students. And it's not so formalized or formulaic. It's really right. a lot more leaving you up to be the chef kind of thing. Totally. So, yeah. Which both of us are teacher educators. And I think that's a, a practice that we want our future teachers yes. to embody is just knowing that it's not just like, you know, a plug and play kind of plan, but yeah. that it's something that they, um, that all of these principles are stuff that they can identify and use and draw into their teaching, like where it becomes most valuable. Yeah. I think for our, for our students, the trick for them is knowing when and how much of each piece to put in. Yeah. Whereas when you have some experience, you kind of, you kind of have senses of that better when you're new, 
overwhelming to think about all of the decisions. How do I do it all at the same time, right? And, but when you are, you know, and I talk to them about layering and, you know, you don't, you know, you don't do this and this, sometimes those things blend together and layer. That's something that comes a little bit with experience. Yeah. And, um, and so, but yeah, it's, that's exactly right. It's, it's a lot about your sense of who you are and who these kids are and what the field is, what you're trying to accomplish all mixed together. Yeah. yeah so. One of the things I think is valuable too, is that for whether you're a new teacher or whether you're a more experienced teacher, the idea that, um, that you have a whole year to establish writing routines and to practice some of these strategies and, um, to give students a lot of experience practicing and to give yourself some experience practicing too, as a teacher. So it's not just like a one and done. Um, so I, I think this book is really valuable both for new teachers, but also for experienced teachers. Who did you have in mind when you wrote it? I actually, I think I was thinking of experienced teachers more. Yeah. Um, I think about strategic writing more for new teachers because I think it gets a basic principle down, but I think I was thinking more of experienced teachers with this one, just because it, it kind of throws out all the ingredients and then says now make your make your recipe figure out what you need to do for you and your students and I think that's something that's difficult maybe in the first couple of years of teaching yeah. but I I don't think it's I don't think it's um, something they shouldn't know you know like you should know about choice and you should know about yourself as a writer and you should know about um all of the things that you bring and what the students bring and you you know all of those things are important to know about but I think I think you can implement it better after you've had just a little bit of some of the basics. Just some grounding. Yes, yes. One of the things, and Debbie's going to share a passage later from the book, but I just wanted to highlight one thing that I love about this book is just um, almost on any page. This is an example of a uh, window into a classroom. And I just love that because um, it draws both on uh, Debbie's experience, but also on other writers and other te- writing teachers' experiences um, in ways that give you a snapshot of like how it works in practice. And I think that's one thing that, especially for books written for teachers, sometimes they can feel really out of touch. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like drawing on these really concrete classroom examples is a really important strength of this book. That was one of the things that I was, and and I think I drove the um, editors crazy because I kept saying, no, no, this has to be on a page and it has to be by this and it can't be over here. It can't be over there. (laughs) I, I really while I was doing the research, I kept saying, I kept seeing teachers all over the country implementing these great practices in their, in their classrooms. And so I, I kept thinking the researchers are right. Teachers know this stuff. They're doing this kind of thing. But if I don't have that yet in my repertoire, what exactly might it look like? And so I might not do exactly what they do, but the way somebody else does it can give me an insight into how I might want to do it. So I thought it's like looking through the window in a classroom and saying, great idea. Now I can tweak it this way for my own and go do my thing. And yeah. I, and I just, I just have to say that by looking those up, I was so impressed. Uh, just when I see what teachers are doing across the country, I know there are lots of good teachers out there and they're having such good practices. And it just makes me proud to be part of this group of people yeah. writing teachers because there's so many of them doing such great things. And- well, and there's so many ways. I mean, our blog is one space where teachers are sharing good practices, but I, what I love about your book is that it really does weave in so many different kinds of teachers experiences. And I'm, I'm curious, some of these are your own. Some of them look like they're from published articles. Um, how did you collect these um, windows into oh, classrooms? Geez. Well, some are from articles because I read journals and of course, some are from my own teaching experiences. Some are, um, I think I, I follow blogs. So a lot of them are blogs, including this blog. Um, I think I have a couple that I've taken from here. Yeah. Um, and, and so it just is, I think um, part of what enriches my experience as a writing teacher is to be parts of those communities, parts of the um, the readership of a journal and parts of the readerships of these different um, blogs and series and, and other webinars, other kinds of things that I can access. I think that makes me a better writing teacher because I'm part of those communities in one way or another. So I can always just be saying, oh, this is an idea that will be perfect for my situation or my classroom. Right. So that's, I just, it's kind of like, 
you know, collecting mentor texts, you know, it's like, you never stop. You're just always like, Oh, this would work for me, or this would be helpful. So, yeah. And almost like once you have that idea or that principle in your mind, then you start to recognize it Mm -hmm. as you see it in practice. You're like, Oh, that's, that's a really good example of collaboration, or that's a really good example of uh, fostering identity. The other, the other thing, and as you look at this book, Debbie said that she drove her editors crazy, but she really has, I doubt you did. They were, (laughs) I think I did. She's so great to work with, but, um, all of the pages, like it's not just prose, right? There's so so many different models and examples. Um, But the other one I wanted to ask you about is in addition to the window into the classroom, you also have these little sections called research toolbox. And so talk to us about that part of of your chapters. Sometimes, um, and this was kind of a revision choice as well. Um, When I realized that the tone of this book was going to be very different, very conversational, I didn't, I still wanted readers to get a chance to know the voices that informed me and my, my development as a writer, writing teacher and someone who's sharing these ideas. I wanted them to hear those voices too, but the voice of the text itself didn't lend itself to bringing those voices actually into the text. So I, I put them in the boxes on the side so you can hear those other voices and know these are people who influenced me and and they have key points and key and their names are there and the re and the resources that they've written in are there so that you can you can move outside of the book to those voices that I think are influential in informing this text even though it um, this text works very much more like a conversation I'm aware that these voices of all these people who have influenced me as a as a teacher and writer over the years are in my head and in my background and under my feet. I mean, they are there. And so how to bring them in and still have this conversation with my readers, um, that's the way I chose to to manage it. And I really feel like I tried to choose gems in those places because I couldn't put so many boxes everywhere that that the page would be too broken up. So, um, So I felt like I chose key places that I hope will inspire readers to say, oh, this is an interesting idea. I'm going to follow it and take that path outside of the book to those sources. Yeah. And one thing I think is really strong about giving these little snapshots of research for practicing teachers is the chance that they have then to, like you said, go outside of the book Mm -hmm. and, and understand more deeply. But even if they don't just having a sense of like, there is research base behind these ideas um, so that when it comes time to advocating for a particular practice that you'd like to see in your school or maybe in a PLC meeting with other teachers who maybe have different ideas that there is a research basis Uh and that you're what you're providing for teachers is access into those conversations um, without maybe the legwork of like digging it all up and finding it and knowing um, who to cite and where these conversations are happening. So I'm hopeful that teachers will also, who, who have this book, will see those research toolboxes, not just as part of a text to skip over, but also something that they can draw on when they need support um, to say these are research-based practices. And here are some of the experts, and this is what they say. Yeah, I think, I hope that's what readers saw, see, because that was my intention. Is to, it's a way to go outside and get more, and get deep into some of yeah. those ideas. Ideas. So I yeah, think that's really powerful. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know if so. You've written many books, um, and I'm just curious. I know that it's a journey along <laughs> every book um, that you write, and I remember hearing from you about different deadlines that you were meeting along <laughs> the way. And I just am curious um, if there's anything you feel like you discovered about yourself as a writer um, through the process and the journey of this of this. Okay, series, and, I guess. and I actually write about one of them in this book. Um, and I was I was teaching at the time, and I was just you know how writing projects can be. Sometimes you just you know you have this stuff that has to be done. And I'm I think I'm very good usually about I know when my firm deadlines are, and I set interim deadlines for myself and have all these things. And I was just having the worst time getting going, and so. <laughs> I, um, so it was, I can remember it was this snowy outside day and I was home and I thought, oh good, I can stay home. It's a snowy day. I had the fireplace on, I had the windows open so I could see the snow falling and, and I got myself a drink and I, you know, that Coke and a hot chocolate both. So there you go, <laughs> I figured that out. but I was sitting there and I was like, 
I'd sit and then I'd think, okay, no, I need to make some soup. So I'd get up and make soup. And then I'd come back and I'd sit and I'd be like, no, I need to make bread to go with the soup. So I was just doing that, you know, for the whole morning. And finally I thought, okay, this friend told me about a show. And so maybe I'll just watch one episode of this show to kind of get myself into the frame of writing. Well, what ended up happening was that I binge watched the whole day. So here's this day set aside for writing and I did nothing. And um, so I came to class on Monday and we were talking about the students who were working on their research, their, their inquiry papers for 423. And, and one of the students was talking about well, what if you get just to this place where you just can't do anything? And so I'm just rattling off. Okay, when you're blocked, what are some drafting strategies? You need to, do you know enough about your subject? Do you know? And, and I'm asking these questions that are the ones I would always ask my students. And all of a sudden it hit me and just right in front of them, I just stopped because I thought this is me. And none of those things worked for me because I knew my subject. I had set aside the time. I had done all the legwork. I had done everything that I tell them would keep me, uh, keeps a person usually from being able to write. And I still couldn't write. And so I stopped and I said, okay, I, I have to confess that there are other things, you know? And so I told them this story about this day on the weekend that I had set aside for writing and had perfect conditions and everything there and still couldn't make myself write. And I said, so I'm, I guess I'm going to have to say that these are starting places, but that at some point, you know, you just have to, I said, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a bad example, but at some point you just have to make yourself do it. And, um, and they just sat there and then one student raised his hand and he said, I can't tell you how good this makes me feel. And I was like, to, you know, to see that someone with experiences, right, as a writer, still struggles yeah. with those things. And, um, and so it really kind of uh, humbled me a little bit to think that, you know, you think you have answers and those answers work like 95% of the time. But in this, in writing this book, I realized that, you know, no matter what all the answers are, there are just sometimes that writing is just hard and it's just like, make yourself do it. Yeah. And, um, and which is what I did that day after I taught the class as I just sat down <laughs> there and like, make myself there was the motivation you needed. Yes. It's so, your confessional. So, but, um, but I do, I, that was one thing that I did learn about myself because although writing has its hard parts and its easy parts, I've never had such a, such a difficult time getting going, uh, as I did in that one day. Honestly. Interesting. So, yeah. Well, we're glad you pushed through. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> um, Kay, would you be willing to read an excerpt of the book for Yes. Our yes. Audience. Okay. There's, um, there were two, um, um, uh, there was that I was thinking about, um, one is that I think the, the title of the book is a little bit like a question it's written hmm. as a statement, but I see it more as a question that has kind of influenced me my whole life as a teacher, because when I first started teaching, I felt like I'd been very well prepared to teach literature and I had not been well prepared to teach writing and so um my question was always what works in writing instruction but um i i when i was reading all this research and and i was thinking about um what i was reading i i had this passage in the book um in in the newer research that's come out since the 27 2007 report i noticed an interesting thread caveats that there is no guarantee that these practices will work in every classroom. What? Isn't this research about practices that have been studied and found to improve writing? Instead, the researchers seem to be acknowledging that there is no way to know which practices need to be emphasized for the particular students we teach. Teachers need to make adaptations for their individual situations. In some ways, these comments seem frustrating. I want to know what works. I want a definitive answer. What I eventually learned to see, though, was the confidence these, that these researchers are placing in teachers. Repeatedly, they urge teachers to consider and adapt the practices they have found to have benefit. They acknowledge that the practices don't come with guarantees, but implementing the practices can improve what we do, maybe not all at once, but eventually. So that's yeah, just really draws out that notion of like teacher agency, that yes. really mm -hmm. teachers are empowered and should feel empowered to understand the full range and yeah. then draw yeah. out what what makes sense yes. in the moment i should i i should say one other thing about this book 
that's kind of an embarrassing thing, but kind of a fun thing. And that is one other thing I learned about myself is at the beginning of every chapter, I have these uh, sketch notes. And I don't know if anybody out here does sketch notes, but I had been learning about it. And that was actually one of the organizational strategies I used for this book because there were so many threads coming from so many places and I had never used that before. So um, I'm not an artist by any means. They're very embarrassing that they're in there, but I felt like I needed to share that that was an organizational strategy I used yeah. to kind of, so anyway, that's another thing. Well, I and you're giving us myself. a glimpse into your own process, which is, I think one of the things I've always loved the most about Dr. Dean is just her ability to, um, bring to bring herself into the conversation. She's not the kind of person who will stand on a pedestal and wag her finger telling you what to do, <laughs> but she is living it and modeling it. Um, and that comes across really strongly in, in her book as she draws on her own experiences. And like she said, shares her sketch notes, like she's, she's doing the thing and also being really transparent about the process of the thing, um, which I think is just really powerful and, um, makes it, it, while there's still a lot to learn, it makes it less intimidating. Um, cause you know that we're all just on this journey together. We are just learning and people have great ideas. And so I try them out and sometimes they work better than other times. And that's, <laughs> the nature, that's the nature of teaching. And I, and I think that's an important part of being a writing teacher. So I want to ask you one question, um, as we close is, is obviously the people who read this blog and we hope who write this for this blog are, um, teachers and professors and parents who care about writing instruction. And so I'm just wondering if you have any like words of wisdom or motivation for people who are interested in sharing their practice and stepping into the space of writing for a blog and making their practice or even their questions public. Um, is there any, any advice or any wisdom that you'd like to share with potential viewers of our interview here today. I would that. say, I would say, I think that probably the things that have led to the most growth for me as a teacher and as a writer um, and as a parent and grandparent of writers is, um, is to take the risk. I think that by putting my ideas in front of other people, I had, I, I think I grew the most. I think I developed my ideas better. I think I learned more. I also think I learned that you don't have to be, have it all figured out before you do that. I think you share an idea and then you learn to share another idea. And I think that going public is really important. One of the things I think that matters is that teachers of writing write. And what does that mean? I talk about it some in the book. It doesn't need, mean that you write a book. That's not necessarily what it means to be a writer. Although one time I had a t-shirt on at Costco and it said, I'm a writer. What's your superpower? And the man stopped me and he goes, what do you write? And I said, oh, I write things for teachers. And he looked scornfully and he said, that's not what writers do. And I was, I said, what? And he said, writers write novels and poetry. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's such a narrow view. I think <laughs> writers write letters and writers write blog posts and writers write um, whatever will help them to grow and develop. And, um, and I think that the thing that makes me happiest is when I see children and parents and teachers who are willing to take up the pen, so metaphorically speaking, and, and go public with their writing. I think you'll be, a, you'll be better at everything you do, because I think writing pushes us to be better at everything we do. So I think that would be right for the blogs yeah <laughs> when they ask you or if you want to volunteer i'd say go for it because it will um it will surprise you what it does one of our goals in addition to sharing really great resources that we hope you can use in your classroom or for your own professional development is just to sort of like pull back the curtain on what like you might see this book and you might think like wow Deborah Dean, Dr. Deborah Dean, she has, she knows so many things and um, she's an expert and she is, but what we wanted to do in these interviews is sort of pull back the curtain on the process. And she's so generously shared um, so much of, of her own process and that it's not a straight line, that it can, it's jaggedy and it goes up and down and there's challenges that all of us face and um, reasons that we feel a little intimidated or a little embarrassed. Um, oh, but, sorry. <laughs> But um, that, that as we do that, um, that we grow and that we learn things about ourselves. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. Sorry, my husband called. <laughs> See, writers are real people too. Um, what works in writing instruction? 
uh, research and practice. 